Age is inevitable. So the sooner we learn to listen and follow the Lord, the better. Today, listen as Pastor Lemming begins the final message in his series on The Good Life. This is our 12th message from the 12 chapters of the book of of Ecclesiastes. And this is the last message uh, from this series of messages. And I want you to follow along with me as we talk today from this very last uh, chapter. Solomon has been on a quest trying to find fulfillment and meaning and purpose in life. His heart had been turned away from God. He had started looking at life like a hedonist. He started living life as a practical atheist. He was leaving God, if you will, out of his life and looking for fulfillment and meaning in life in the things that only this life can provide. And the result was that he came up empty over and over again. He didn't find satisfaction. He didn't find fulfillment. He didn't find meaning. He didn't find purpose. And to him, life had become little more than vanity. It had become little more than chasing after the wind. It had become nothing more than a pursuit for nothing. And he was discouraged. As you read through this book, you you read through and you almost get the impression that he has a depression that he's battling with uh, as he's going through living his life apart from God. But when you get to the 12th chapter, you see the Uh, this great Solomon that we all know so well, we see him giving us what is the conclusion of this whole matter. And I want you to look at the end of chapter 12, and he tells you. So let me just go to the end of the book, the last chapter. Let me tell you how it concludes, and then we're going to go back. We're going to work our way back to this section. He says in verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is man's all. For God will bring every work in the judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. In essence, he says, after all that I have tried, after everything that I have investigated, after all of the things in which I have involved myself that have brought me nothing, that have lacked fulfillment and meaning and purpose, let me just tell you what is the conclusion. If you want a life that has significance, if you want a life that has purpose, and you want a life that has meaning, fear God. It's a filial fear. It's a, it's a family fear. It's not the kind of Freddy Krueger fear that you think of. This is a, a respectful, honoring fear that is demonstrated toward the Almighty God, that kind of a fear. And out of that fear grows a desire to be obedient to God. Obedience to God brings, brings the blessing of God to our lives. Obedience to God brings meaning and purpose and fulfillment to our lives. Living our lives in the fear of God, in obedience to God, causes us to understand the significance that God has in each of our lives. And so that's how he closes He says, let me just tell you what the conclusion is. I've been there. I've done that. I've got the T-shirt to show for it. And I can tell you that all of these things that I've tried cannot satisfy you. Yet you'll only be satisfied when you're serving the Lord and when you're honoring God with all of your life. And so that's how he's going to end this book. But what's interesting to me about what he does here at the last chapter is that he tries to gather together all the young people. Now, I'm not going to qualify what is young, because young is sort of uh, various depending on uh, who you are. Some people are older in years and young at heart, and some are younger in years and they're old at heart. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I'm not going to try to categorize Solomon when he wrote this. It was late in the years of his life. Uh, he ruled in Jerusalem for 40 years, and then he died. It's commonly believed that he was about 20 to 25 when he came to power. So he would have been 60 to 65 years of age uh, when he was writing these words and when he came to that place of meeting his maker. 
And so you, you can determine what might be young, but I would suggest it certainly involves our young people, our children, and our teens, our college students. It involves those of you that are 20s and 30s and 40s, all of you that are in those age brackets, and even maybe into your 50s and right on up to Solomon at 60. The reality is that all of us need to heed the advice that he has to give because he calls together the young people and he says, look, I've been there, I've done it, I've got the t-shirt, listen to me. You're not going to find what you're looking for where you're looking for it. You're only going to find it when you fear God and when you serve the Lord with all of your heart and you obey him with all of your being. That's the only place that you're going to find the purpose and the meaning of life. And he begins in chapter 12, verse 1, by telling us what he wants us to do, who it is that we should pay attention to, and then when we're supposed to be doing this. Notice, he says, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. What is it he wants us to do? He wants us to remember. He wants us to remember. Please understand that when you see this word, remember, He's not just simply saying, I want you to call to mind some facts that you can put down on a test and then you can forget again a day or two later. The whole idea of remembering here is the idea that you're regarding God and you are responding to God, that you are surrendering yourself to God, your self-sufficiency, you're dying to that self-sufficiency and you're committing yourself to him. As a matter of fact, this whole idea of remembering has the idea of, of acting decisively on behalf of someone. Let me see if I can illustrate it to you from another place where this word is used. You may remember the story of Hannah and how much she wanted to be able to have a child, specifically a son. But God did not open her womb and God did not give her the ability for years to be able to have that son. She would go to the temple with her husband, and she would desire to be able to take that son, but she didn't have that son. And so on one occasion, she goes with her, her husband, Elkanah, and they go to the, the, the temple or the tabernacle. And while she's there, she is so grieved that she's not been able to have this child that after things are finished, she goes back to the tabernacle, and she begins to pray She's, she's crying tears. She's, she's talking to God. Her lips are moving, but she's not saying anything out, li out loud. Eli, the priest, sees her, thinks that she's been drinking. Surely this woman must be drunk. Go home, lady. You shouldn't be drinking like this. Go home. And she says, no, 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 I'm not drinking at all. I'm pouring my heart out to God. I desire for God to give me a child. I desire God to give me a son. And what was his name going to be? It's going to be Samuel. I want God to give me a son. And Eli says, God's heard your request. God's going to give you that son. She leaves. She and her husband, Elkanah, go back. And the result is that they conceive a child together. But here's what it says about it. It says that the Lord remembered Hannah. That's the same word. The Lord remembered Hannah. In other words, the Lord acted decisively on her behalf. So that when Solomon comes and he says, remember now your creator in the days of your youth, he's not telling you just to bring up something in your mind to think about and ponder for a little while like some of you will do on Sunday and go away and not think about it anymore. He is saying, I want you to act decisively on behalf of what I'm telling you. I want you to fear God. I want you to serve the Lord. I want you to Give your hearts to the, to, to the Lord and to his service. I, I want you to obey what he tells you to do. And I don't want you to give it lip service or just give it a brief moment of memory. I want it to be something on which you act decisively. As a matter of fact, he even tells them a little bit later in this verse, you'll notice, he says, remember now your creator in the days of your youth before, see the word? <clears throat> before the difficult days come. In verse 2, it's the same Hebrew construction. My translation uses the word while. Yours may use the word before. It's the same Hebrew construction. Before the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are darkened. Or if you look at chapter 12, verse 6, he uses the same construction again. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed. 
In other words, I want you to bring this to your mind. I want it to be a decisive act on your part. I want you to do more than just think about it on a Sunday and go away and do nothing else about it. I want you to surrender yourself to the Lord, and I want you to give yourself in service to God. That's the, that's the what. Notice the who. Remember now your creator. God is your creator. You are not a matter of time and chance. You're not a matter of a natural selection that took place. God formed you and God fashioned you in your mother's womb and he made you distinctly like you are with the personality that you have, with the giftings that are your own. God is the one who shaped you and God is the one who made you and God is the one who is at work in your life. I want you to remember decisively, ready to act on his behalf, the one who made you. Listen, God gives us lots of abilities. God gives us lots of gifts. But God intends for those abilities and those gifts to be used for his own glory and for the advancement of his kingdom. Amen? Amen. Now, it doesn't mean we can't use them for other things. Seven times in the book of Ecclesiastes, he tells us that God wants us to enjoy our lives. But enjoying our lives doesn't mean we forget God, that we set aside the things of God, that we place them as a secondary or a third matter of our lives. Enjoying our lives, yes, but it means that we never forget. We're constantly acting in a decisive way that we are remembering that God fashioned us for his own glory, and God is most glorified when we are serving and honoring him and fearing him and obeying him. You know, you matter because you were made You matter because you were made by God. He says, you were fashioned in your mother's womb. When nobody else could see you, God could see you. And God made you exactly like you are. You say, well, I don't like all the things about myself. Well, that may be true. None of us really looks in the mirror and says, well, aren't I beautiful? (laughs) But the fact of the matter is God made you for a purpose exactly like you are. And he says, I want you to remember I want you to remember, I want you to decisively act on, stop your self-sufficiency, commit yourself to God, get involved with the things of God, because God made you and what he has given to you is unique and special and intended to be involved and invested in the work of the Almighty. But then he says when, he says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Before there are difficulties in your life, before there is the decline of the body, before death comes to visit, when you have your health and you have your strength and you have your abilities, I want you to stop and decisively act. I want you to get involved and put your hand to the plow, and I want you to go to work, and I want you to remember God has shaped you and made you who you are. God has made you for his glory, and God has worked for you to do for the advancement of the cause of Christ. And I want you to do it while you're young, while you're healthy, while you're breathing, while there's life in you, while you have the strength of your body. Let me ask you a question this morning. Where are your young people? Where are your children? Why aren't they sitting here listening to the preaching of the word of the living God? Where are our young people, so many of them serving behind the scenes, and aren't we thankful for that? As a matter of fact, there's a lot of technology around here. If we didn't have young people to operate it, none of the rest of us could ever operate it. Got a lot of young people working down in children's church and a lot of young people working in other places. But look, I'm looking at the faces of people, and a lot of us are in my age bracket. Where are the young people? Oh, they're pulled by this and pulled by that and pulled by career and pulled by sports and pulled by activities and pulled by this and pulled by that. And Solomon comes and says, look, you can try all those things, but you will never find the meaning and the purpose and the fulfillment of life. Didn't Jesus say, I want to give you life and I want to give you life more? What's the word? I want to give you life more abundant. But that life more abundant comes in living with that filial fear, that family fear, reverence and respect for God, where you get obedient to the Lord and you do what God says and you plug into what God is doing in the world and you don't wait. You don't wait 
until the years of your life have passed and the energy is gone and the strength is no longer there. You start while you're young and you give the best that you have. As a matter of fact, if you're writing down phrases, here's the first phrase you want to write. Start early and give your best. That's what he's saying. Start early serving God and give your best. Start early serving God and give your best. I was reading about a lady, an elderly lady, older lady, I shouldn't say an elderly lady, but an older lady who was trying to mentor and bring a younger lady along. And this young lady was just sort of pushing it aside, this whole matter of remembering now the creator in the days of her youth. She said that she was going to serve the Lord and she was going to give time to Christ and she was going to give of her life to the, to the things of God, but she, she had some other things she wanted to do first and she had to push the, the things of God off a little while because there's other things that were more important and more valuable to her. And the older Christian lady kept trying to think, how can I show this woman the folly of what she's doing? One day she got some fresh cut flowers on a Monday, this elderly lady Got some fresh cut flowers on a Monday. And by the end of the week, those flowers had wilted. And she thought to herself, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my younger friend these wilted flowers. Well, she did that. She boxed them up. She sent them to her younger friend. And when her younger friend got them, she immediately looked at them. These wilted, drying, dying flowers, she looked at them. And she called her friend and said, why did you send me wilted flowers after you've used them and they're old? And this older, wiser woman said, that's exactly what you're saying to Jesus. You're saying that you're going to give your life to the things of this world, and then when you're old and wilted, you're going to give the remains to Jesus. And how many of us put off serving God? How many of you are sitting here? How many of you are listening to this service? Your youth is there. Your strength is there. Your mind is sharp. Your abilities are, are available. But you're using them everywhere but in the service of the master of the, of, of the king, of the master, the king of kings. You're using them everywhere except for the advancement of God's church. You realize what God said he was going to build in this world? The one thing God said he was going to build in this church, in, in this world, was the church. And yet it's so often the last thing we think of, the service that we render to God. One person said it this way, we're so busy, it's like burning the candle at both ends and blowing the smoke of our lives in the face of God. We're so busy burning the candle at both ends with all of our activities and then thinking God's going to be pleased when we blow the smoke of our lives in his face. God won't be pleased. As a matter of fact, he's going to bring all of our works into judgment, and he's going to be asking us at some point at the judgment seat of Christ, why didn't you give the good years, the strong years, the best years of your life in service to the master? Why didn't you make time to remember, to decisively act on behalf of the service of God, fearing God and obeying God? Why didn't you do that? I was thinking uh, this morning, talking to Mary about this message. Since she wrote it, I figured out how to talk to her about it. <laughs> I was talking to Mary about it. I said, I, you remember when we, when we were serving and I was a youth pastor for five years? You remember what we did every Saturday evening and every Sunday afternoon? She immediately remembered. During Sunday school, we would set up for, in the gymnasium of our church, we would set up for the young people that were coming. We had designed a program we called Encounter. And we had developed a backdrop made out of large pieces of cardboard that were fashioned to a square piece of wood that you could fold it up and you could move it and you could store it. And there were several of these pieces. And every Saturday night, we would go over and we would unfold that cardboard background. We'd put out a raised platform and we'd set up, Mary and I would set up 150 chairs every Sunday every Saturday evening. And then every Sunday after church was finished, we'd go back out we fold all that up. we put it back away. we pull up those chairs and put them on the rack so that you could push them out of the way because the church had a school and they used that gymnasium for basketball and for various other things, PE and various other things. All that stuff had to be gone. The platform had to be taken up and moved. A lot of times there were young people after church that would come and help us. 
But many times the parents were ready to go home or ready to go eat, and Mary and I would spend till 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the afternoon putting those things back up, getting ready so that we could go home with our young children. I look back across those days. Those are some of the best days of my life. We worked hard, and we worked long, but I can't do that anymore. I have to work smarter than I used to work. i got to be more efficient than I used to be. Why? Because my strength isn't there like it used to be. I can't go as long as I used to be able to go. I can't do as much as I used to be able to do. And that's true for all of us. And Solomon comes and says, remember now the creator. Remember, decisively act upon Stop your self-sufficiency. Stop the distractions of your life. Get committed to the service of the Almighty God while you have youth, while you are young, and you can give the strength of your life to what matters more than anything else in life. Now, please don't get mad at me. Winning championships is absolutely important. There's a lot of things you learn from playing in sports and having, uh, you know, uh, uh, talent contests and uh, having dance contests. There's a lot of things that are absolutely valuable, invaluable by doing those kind of things. But when you stand before the Lord, you're not going to hold your trophy and say, look what I did, Lord. He's going to be asking you, how did you serve me? How did you make a difference for the cause of Christ? How did you bring others to faith in Jesus? How did you plug in to help couples to save their marriages? How did you encourage somebody who was sitting around you, who came to church or who who sat there in front of you or behind you, and you spoke a word that lifted their spirits and caused them to be able to laugh when they've been so sad? How is it that you feel the loneliness of those that are aged and they're wondering about life? In the meaning of life and the purpose of life, does anybody even know who I am anymore? Do they even care? You remember what James says? James says, pure religion and undefiled is to care for widows and orphans. But the truth of the matter is, we've got a lot of orphans today. They are functional orphans. They have parents, but then again, they don't really have parents. They don't have anybody raising them, loving them, showing them the way. They are functional orphans, and we have widows and widowers amongst us. Paul, but James says that's pure religion. You know, pure religion isn't winning a trophy. That's fun. That's exciting. You ought to do it if you can do it. Pure religion is when you're serving others and you're doing it out of obedience to Christ and you're investing yourself in the service of the master. He says, remember now. Remember, that's what? I want you to act decisively on this. I want you to regard God and I want you to respond to him in an active way. Remember now. Who is this that you're remembering? It's the creator. It's the one who made you who you are like you are. Remember now your creator, and when do I remember him? In the days of my youth, while the energy and the strength of my life is there, while I have the most ability, the most opportunity, my mind is as sharp as it's ever been. That's when I should be remembering God. One of our ladies wrote on social media this week something that when I read it, I just about jumped out of my boots, and I don't wear boots. I just about jumped out of my boots. This is what she said. I asked her permission if I could read it. I was just working in the backpack room. That's the room where we keep food for the boys and girls that we feed on the weekends. I was just working in the backpack room for a few minutes in between appointments, and I was looking at how big and how many buildings we have at church. I was thinking about how many people attend or watch online. Then I started pondering. If pastor was sick, Will we have to just cancel church? If Sarah was sick, will we have to just cancel nursery? If Dee Dee and Rebecca were sick, will we just have to cancel children's church? If Leah was sick, will we just have to cancel the fifth grade class? If Matt and April were sick, will we just have to cancel youth group? If Charles and Tamara were sick, will we just have to cancel college and career class? If someone was sick that works the food pantry, would we just have to close the pantry? If Bill was sick, would the shut-in visitation stop? She goes on just thinking. 
There is so much to do, and it can't all be done by just a few. Where is your place in the ministry? Do you just attend, or can you hold a door, direct traffic, rock a baby, help with media, help be present in, 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 if teaching isn't your gift, help be present if teaching isn't your gift? Can you pull weeds, etc., cetera, et cetera, et cetera? There's always a place to be able to serve if you want to serve. Amen? Amen. You start early. You start early and you give your best. Don't wait till the flowers are wilted and all you have are these wilted, dried up flowers to give to God. If you're young and you've got vitality and your mind is sharp and your body is strong, now is the time. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. But then he moves along. He says, I want you to remember before the difficult days come. And difficult days do come, don't they? I want you to remember, he says, verse 2, before the sun, the light, and the moon, and the stars are darkened. You know what he's talking about? The storms come. You know when you're young, storms come into your life. They absolutely come into your life. But you're young and you're vivacious and you're strong and you're healthy and you see the storm coming and you know it's going to pass eventually and you think to yourself, it's going to be okay. I can see the silver lining out at the end of the clouds and it's going to be all right. But you get to a place in life where you begin to feel a little differently about the storms. They begin to gather more quickly. I remember my mother at 96 when she passed away. My mother was the eternal optimist. She was a woman of faith who believed God. She would never have lived until 96 had she not believed God. But the storms just kept coming, and they kept coming more quickly, and the sky didn't brighten between the storms as frequently as it used to brighten until it didn't brighten at all until finally, in those early morning hours, she stepped over into the presence of her Savior. Remember now the creator in the days of your youth before the difficulties come, before the decline comes and the storms start building up and the light that you used to see or that you saw regularly suddenly isn't seen nearly as regularly or maybe not seen at all because one storm after another storm just keeps building up. Thanks for joining us today and we hope you'll return next week to hear the second part of this message. If you'd like more information about today's message or Lewis Memorial Baptist Church, feel free to contact us. We'd love to hear how this ministry is helping you in your daily walk.